through his work on this Snooper computer project and his PhD at UCLA, Vint has been utterly fascinated by computing and computer science. This all led to his key contribution with Bob Kahn and others of TCPIP in 1978. At that time, I was busy testing the UK's experimental packet switch service, EPSS. This was thought to be a strange aberration from the historic and obvious approach of circuit switching. Uh, the then consensus, apart from a few of us, was that packet switching would never catch on. The internet, powered by TCP IP, went on to completely blindside the world's then all-powerful public telecom operators, even when they reluctantly implemented their own packet switching through the CCITTX series protocols. The dominance of TCP IP became total, and perhaps Vint might say a little today about how that was achieved. As indicated on the slide we had earlier, Vint will speak for around 30 minutes, then we'll have around 20 minutes of Q&A. Please submit your questions through the chat facility, and I will repeat them for Vint's response. We'll close promptly at uh, 1600 GMT. So without further ado, over to Vint. Implementations done. Can I just ask everybody again, please mute yourselves, except for Vint. Sir, first of all, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to reminisce. Uh, second, I have not prepared slides and other kinds of things, so this is, you know, talking heads. I hope everybody will uh, uh, accept that. Um, and third, I'm not going to get everything into this half an hour or so that it probably should be there. Uh, but my focus of attention is going to, to be on uh, the UK uh, contributions to early networking uh, to the extent that I'm able to, uh, to cover that. There are tangential things that are probably equally important, not least of which, for example, is the OSI effort, which competed with TCP IP for quite some time. Uh, but in a half an hour's time, I can't cover everything. So I'm going to try to focus on the uh, UK contributions uh, uh, primarily uh, and then pick up the other things uh, either in Q&A or possibly just uh, in brief mentions uh, for reference. So let me start out by uh, pointing out that uh, packet switching is at the core of uh, internet, and uh, that's uh, a very fundamental uh, contribution, and the UK has a role to play there. Uh, Paul Barron uh, at the Brand Corporation speculated about something called message blocks and their use in digitized speech distribution uh, in a, a post-nuclear uh, scenario. So he had the idea of a very proliferated network with uh, this is like 1962, and so we're, we're talking way before microprocessors and other kinds of things existed. But he postulated the possibility of building a, what we would today call a packet switch voice network, uh, which had extremely um, rich connectivity and therefore could, uh, could function even with loss of significant portions of uh, the system. Uh, his work was known uh, to uh, Donald Davies at the National Physical Laboratory, who began exploration of packet switching himself in the mid 1960s um, and was able to obtain sufficient funding to build a one node uh, network. So, in a sense, uh, one of the first local area networks uh, using packet switching as the primary communications technology. Uh, in 62, uh, also, Leonard Kleinrock at MIT did his dissertation on uh, the subject of stochastic flow and delay in message switch systems. The uh, queuing theoretic um, models of message switching and packet switching are essentially mathematically the same. And so uh, his analysis contributed to a conclusion to use packet switching in uh, a, an American Defense Department effort called ARPANET, which I suspect most of you are familiar with. Uh, that effort uh, was initiated by a, a frustrated head of the Information Processing Techniques Office at ARPA, uh, Robert Taylor, who found uh, that he had three terminals sitting in his office, one to get to computer A, another to get to computer B, and a third to get to computer C. And he said, why can't we have a network so I only have to have one terminal? And of course, there are all kinds of implications associated with actually making that work. Uh, and that was, of course, the core of the ARPANET project. Uh, the primary problem there is getting a whole bunch of different kinds of computers to communicate with each other, despite the fact that they had different operating systems and, you know, word lengths and uh, other uh, parameters. 
uh, and then figuring out what standards to use so that a single criminal could talk to all three or, or more uh, computers through some kind of network. The guy that was recruited to build this network was uh, Larry Roberts, who was brought down to ARPA from uh, the uh, Lincoln Laboratory at MIT around 1968. Uh, when the implementation of the packet switch ARPANET was done uh, by Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, uh, a company, a research company in, uh, Mass in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Donald, Donald had uh, uh, an indirect impact on in the ARPANET development because uh, one of his colleagues, uh, Roger Scandlebury, uh, attended uh, a, an ACM meeting in Gatlinburg, Tennessee in 1967, where uh, Roberts presented the ARPANET idea, which at the time was only an idea. So um, Scandlebury attended the meeting and uh, met Larry Roberts and relayed to him uh, the project that was going on uh, at, uh, at the National Physical Laboratory. And in particular, he impressed on Roberts the importance of using high-speed links for reducing transmission delay. And Roberts had been going into this thinking 2,400 bits a second would be okay, uh, based on some other tests that he had done earlier. Uh, and uh, Scandlebury convinced him to go to the maximum he could get, which at the time in the US was 50 kilobits a second by binding uh, half a, a dozen uh, analog channels together using a Bell 303A modem. So, uh, so there was a very direct effect uh, from the work that was going on at, uh, at the National Physical Laboratory. Uh, it also turned out uh, that uh, my colleague, Robert Kahn, who was very much involved uh, in the development of the uh, ARPANET design uh, at Bolt, Baron, Eck, and Newman. But in late 1972, he moved to ARPA uh, and started uh, the internet project there along with several other networking projects, all of which were, uh, I, I would say, stimulated by the idea that uh, we could use computers in command and control. So the success of the ARPANET uh, led to the Defense Department's decision to invest in networking for command and control, computer networking for command and control. And in order for that to work, uh, the computers would end up being in ships at sea and mobile vehicles and, uh, and aircraft. And all we had done in the ARPANET was to build fixed installations connected by dedicated telephone circuits. So uh, Bob showed up in my office at Stanford University in the spring of 1973, telling me that we had a problem. Uh, and the, uh, the problem was how to interconnect a mobile package. Uh, so Khan uh, comes to Stanford and says, uh, in order to use computers and command and control, we're going to have to use mobile radio networks and satellite networks uh, to connect ships at sea to ship to ship and ship to shore. So he's got three different networks, the ARPANET and mobile packet radio net and the packet satellite net, and they all have different characteristics, error rates, delays, uh, packet formats, addressing structures. And he says, how are we gonna put all those together in a uniform way? That was the internet problem. And by uh, September of 73, we had uh, concluded uh, a particular design which we briefed uh, to a, a, uh, a NATO-sponsored meeting at the University of Sussex uh, in September of 1973 uh, and uh, called it the, the Transmission Control Protocol. Uh, we continued working uh, with a collection of colleagues in the International Network Working Group, which was formed in October of 72 uh, after or in the course of an international computer, communi computer communications conference in Washington, D.C., where the ARPANET was demonstrated and many of our colleagues from Europe uh, participated in the, in the conference. So uh, I ended up chairing this international network working group. Uh, by 1973, uh, June of 73, an ARPANET tip, an, uh, an imp which is capable of supporting terminals, uh, was installed at University College London and connected by a landline up to uh, the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment which housed the uh, Norwegian seismic array radar or seismic okay. array uh, uh, sensor system. It was tracking uh, underground nuclear tests by the Russians to make sure they didn't exceed the uh, limited test ban treaty constraints. 
So uh, UCL uh, comes up on the ARPANET in mid-year 1973 and then hosts uh, or it participates in this uh, Sussex meeting. Uh, and in the course of, uh, of that work, uh, Kirstein's group uh, became uh, very much involved uh, in uh, thinking about the implementation of TCP. So during the period from 19, from, the, from January of 74 to December of 74, uh, my research group at Stanford University developed a detailed specification for the TCP protocols. And uh, starting in January of 1975, implementations were undertaken at University College London uh, and at Bolt Baron Neck and Newman in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And if you're interested in seeing a kind of a, a list of participants in the early uh, internet development, uh, do a Google search for birth of internet plaque. Uh, it's, uh, you'll find it actually at MIT, the picture is there, even though the plaque is at Stanford University. It was put up in 2005 and it lists all of the colleagues who were early participants in the development of the TCP IP protocols, uh, among which you will find uh, a number of people from uh, University College London, particularly Peter Kirstein, who led the project, Frank Dangan, Martin Gallon, Peter Higginson, Andrew Hinchley, and Adrian Stoke. Uh, some of them are still with us and some are not. Uh, Peter and Adrian in particular passed away, I'm sorry to say, uh, but they were uh, key players uh, in the UK uh, developments. Now, simultaneous uh, with the uh, work that was going on at NPL and the uh, early work that was going on in the US on the TCP development, uh, there were a set of uh, colored book protocols that were being developed uh, uh, by uh, the UK teams, not just UCL, but others uh, in the UK. And so we had um, multiple uh, packet switching implementations uh, underway, uh, more or less in the same general time frame in the mid-1970s uh, and, and I, would say, I would say late 60s uh, to mid-1970s. Among those uh, were the X25 protocols that were standardized in the consultative committee uh, uh, for uh, international telegraphy and uh, telephony, now called ITU. Uh, and that group uh, consisted of uh, a team of people from uh, four different network activities. The, um, uh, in Canada, it was Datapack. Uh, in France, it was Transpack. Uh, in uh, the US, it was Telenet. And in, in the UK, the aforementioned EPSS uh, were part of the team that developed the X25 and the subsequent X75 protocol. So that was a well-developed and, and well-deployed uh, packet switching implementation that was uh, in commercial use uh, very early on. Uh, in the late 1970s and, and 80s and continued to be used all the way up until uh, actually quite late in the game. I think I, I didn't shut down uh, my X25 implementations when I was in MCI until something like 2003. Uh, so uh, they lasted quite a long time and for all I know there may still be some left but they were heavily uh, used by the uh, finance, financial uh, sector. Uh, however, there was uh, other uh, interests here. In addition to the uh, formative work that was done at NPL, which influenced the ARPA network, uh, there was also in the, uh, I would say, the late 1970s, an initiative in the International Standards Organization called Open Systems Interconnection. And I'm sure many of you might have been uh, involved in or certainly know about that uh, activity. Uh, so the OSI protocols, which developed the seven layer uh, structure of uh, protocols, uh, was a competitor to the TCP IP protocols. And for a period roughly from 1978 till 1993, those two protocols were the, uh, the primary contenders uh, for global standardization. Uh, X25 continuing to run uh, as a service, but not necessarily continuing to compete for uh, a uh, global um, standardization. It, already, it was already standardized, so the, the other two were competing for <clears throat> global adoption. I would uh, pick 1993 as the date when um, TCP IP seemed to become the dominant choice because uh, I was, had been elected president of the Internet Society at the time, 
and had gone to the American National Institutes of Standards and Technology, uh, saying that this competition between TCPIT and OSI had been going on for 15 years, we should, you know, resolve this. And uh, so I asked them to appoint a blue ribbon committee to evaluate the two, and they came back and said that uh, that uh, because TCPIP implementations were more widely available than the OSI implementations, that they would agree that uh, the U.S. government could make use of TCPIP uh, in lieu of OSI, which it had adopted as its preferred protocols uh, in the Defense Department and, uh, and other parts of the U.S. government, but there were no implementations widely available, whereas TCP had sort of grown uh, organically. Uh, out of many uh, open implementations uh, and open standardization freely available uh, through, uh, through the internet. So uh, the important part here, I think, is that uh, the UK has had a uh, hand in all of this, uh, not only in its uh, early days of the National Physical Laboratory packet switching exploration, but the colored book protocol effort, the subsequent uh, European informatics network effort, uh, which was led by Derek Barber, by the way, uh, whose name I was having trouble recalling earlier. Uh, Derek was part of the NPL uh, team, as I recall, or certainly very uh, worked very closely with uh, Donald Davies and his group. So um, I've collapsed an awful lot of stuff here, and I've left out something very important, uh, which comes at the end of 1991, and that's uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee's contribution to the World Wide Web, um, which uh, it comes out of CERN, as many of you know, uh, and is um, sometimes mistakenly conflated with the internet, uh, and the two are distinct. The internet is the underlying structure which supports the World Wide Web, and the World Wide Web is this su substantial uh, application space in which almost everything gets done these days uh, in the network environment. So uh, the important, uh, an important message here is to, is to say that the UK has had an extraordinary impact over decades now on the evolution of the internet and the applications that are uh, part of, uh, of the uh, uh, internet's operation. Uh, going back to uh, some of the other uh, effort that has gone on, I would say that uh, EIN, for example, was a, a major effort, but which did not yield uh, the results that I think people were hoping for, as I recall, based on uh, the OSI uh, architecture. Uh, so uh, the, the thing I want to take away uh, from all of this is first the, the UK's involvement has been absolutely central uh, to this development. And second, uh, that in the OSI case, there were so many options that uh, it was it was hard to get things to interwork because you had you know, five different kinds of transport protocol, for example, TP0 up to TP4. Uh, and uh, this, a similar problem arose in the X25 world uh, where there were different options and you had to negotiate. And if you couldn't come to a common agreement, then uh, you couldn't open a connection. And in the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is where most of the standardization of TCP IP has taken place, a general preference has been to pick one thing. If you're going to do something, do it one way. Don't, don't do it more than one way where you have to negotiate. Uh, of course, that rule gets broken uh, from time to time. An example is in crypto, where multiple crypto very, uh, uh, schemes are, uh, are available and negotiated and probably have to be that way because over time, as, uh, as crypto uh, algorithms become weak relative to computing capability to attack them, you have to select new protocols that are resistant to those kinds of attacks. And so you're sort of forced into an evolutionary path, but for the most part, uh, picking one way to do things uh, facilitates interoperability. And if there's anything core to all networking, it is the ability to establish standards so that things can interoperate, even if the parties have never met and negotiated an, ag an agreement to interwork. You just meet the same standards and the result is you get interoperability. So uh, I'm you know, conscious of the time and I'm thinking that uh, what might be uh, best done here is to go into a kind of a Q&A mode. Now, I'm not seeing a whole lot of Q&A questions yet. Uh, a lot so, of them have come to me directly rather than... I, I think, okay. And in that case, let me propose uh, that uh, 
Well, let me, let me add one other thing here. Yeah. The International Network Working Group was formed in October 1972 and involved an awful lot of people in Europe and, uh, and elsewhere. <clears throat> um, anyway, coming back to Inwig, uh, the thing I wanted to uh, emphasize is that the uh, extent of collaboration in the exploration of packet switching technology. Uh, it was not just a US thing. It was not just a European thing. They, there were many colleagues uh, largely in Europe, some in uh, Asia, and later uh, colleagues in uh, Latin America. Uh, and of course, today, uh, anyone uh, who's looked at the evolution of the internet uh, has to appreciate the enormous scope of collaboration and cooperation and competition that uh, animates this entire system. But the UK folks, you who are listening, uh, can be uh, both reassured and proud of the fact that you had an early role to play, I and mean, your colleagues had an early role to play in the uh, internet's development and uh, and evolution. So I'll I'll stop there. Uh, happy to engage in Q and A. Uh, so uh, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. That's great, Tim. Thanks very much. I'll I'll take I've, I've got a whole pile of questions here, but. Uh... I'm going to take one that leads on from what you were saying about, in a sense, why TCP IP won out. And it's a question from Michael Chui to everyone. Question for Vint. Would love to get your perspective on how IETF operates now versus back in the old days and about how standard setting interoperability might evolve going forward. I think one of your points was that the standard setting capability of IETF and reducing ridiculous levels of optionality is, is one thing that led to it winning out so well. Uh, well, I would say that IETF has evolved too, and like all institutions, as it gets older, it gets uh, more stodgy. And so there are people who complain that it's not as swift in its uh, efforts as it used to be. Uh, but I have uh, staff uh, who are part of the uh, Internet Engineering Steering Group and who continue to try to push the, the ball forward. Uh, I would say that it's a slower process now than I would like. Uh, but it still is remarkably open. Uh, you can't join the IETF. You just show up. And, and you know, there's, no, there's a mailing list, but there's no formal membership. Uh, and uh, the, the merit of your ideas is what has to carry the day. You have to persuade your uh, colleagues uh, that your ideas have merit. And that's still the case. And it continues. It's now in its 9,000th uh, request for comments publication. Uh, starting in, way back in 1969 with the first one was written by Steve Crocker, uh, a good friend of mine, good friend and still a good friend. So, so the answer is it continues to function. Uh, it is still supported by the Internet Society, which is one of the reasons the Internet Society was created in the first place. Uh, so I would say it still is a, a source of considerable uh, innovation. Uh, of course, there is also the World Wide Web Consortium, and that leads much of the World Wide Web development and standardization. Uh, and so those two organizations are, I would say, key to uh, Internet's continued evolution. A question that follows on from that, Vint, and it's from Pete, but I don't know Pete who. It says, hi, Jim, my question for Vint. I coded my first ICMP packets in 1983 as an undergraduate at UCL. The RFC documents were a must read. How does Vint recall how the idea of calling documentation a request for comment and how effective was it in working in a global distributed team? So the answer is that my good friend Steve Crocker is the one who coined the term. Uh, in fact, he did so in conjunction with and possibly in response to a suggestion by a colleague at uh, SRI International. And I apologize, his name has gone out of my head, which is embarrassing, uh, because the guy who made the suggestion of request for comments uh, uh, was the guy who uh, worked with Charlie Klein at UCLA on the very first test of two nodes of the ARPANET, because the first two were UCLA. Uh, and uh, it's, his name is Duval. His name is Duval. Uh, first name is, is escaping me. But he's, uh, Steve Crocker says that we've all mentioned to him this idea of calling it request for comments as a humble kind of thing. We, we were graduate students, we didn't have any authority, and Steve was worried that uh, we would be just understood as claiming authority that we didn't have. And so that's where the term came from. Uh, and it is stuck, as you know. Uh, and I think it worked very well because um, the graduate students were actually given implicit authority uh, to 
just figure out how to solve the problem of computer communication because the principal investigators didn't know the answer. And so they basically just sort of left it to us as graduate students to go figure it out. And, you know, that's perfectly reasonable. That's what PhD dissertations are about, right? The, the, the principal investigator and advisor don't necessarily know the answer, but they can help point you in the direction to solve it. Right. Now, another question, Vin, but what I'm going to do is to ask Brian Randall to unmute uh, because he's got some comments and queries on the IP versus OSI battle I think he'd like to make. Brian, can you unmute? Yes, I have. Hi, Vint. Quite Hi, a while since Brian, you... it's wonderful to hear your voice. Yeah, uh, I've enjoyed very much listening to you. Uh, there are a couple of, um, I'll call them incidents, uh, which uh, uh, gave me great entertainment uh, uh, during what I'll call the IP OSI uh, uh, battle years. One, of course, was the, uh, the book Elements of Networking Style by Pad Lipsky. Um, the, the series of little posters stroke jokes in the back of that is great. For those of you who don't know any of them, I'll just quote one, which was, if you know what you're, what you're doing, if you don't know what you're doing, even 17 layers isn't enough. <laughs> um, the others are also worth looking at. Uh, but a local one, uh, two colleagues of mine at Newcastle were very much involved uh, in the uh, issue of uh, getting Janet, the academic network, um, to take uh, to go over to IP. And they did that by the very devious means of suggesting, oh, well, uh, for, as an experiment, uh, let's uh, run IP on top of X25. They knew full well what would happen there. Um, <laughs> and um, as, as a bystander, uh, I watched the glee with which um, uh, they achieved that. Harry Whitfield was head of the relevant committee. Dennis Russell was um, our head of networking and very much involved in that implementation. And uh, I enjoyed that activity as a lovely mixture of technical merit and deviousness. Uh, well, I'm sure that Peter Kirstein would have appreciated that and probably knew about it and did appreciate it. Uh, oh, one thing, sure. I think, uh, Peter had an extraordinary um, challenge because uh, for a while, I think he was trying to translate between TCP IP connections and colored book protocol connections. Mm -hmm. Uh, he also had the problem of uh, dealing with uh, X25 and the charging structure for X25 uh, and the question of who pays for what as things cross from the ARPANET into X25 land and vice versa. Uh, so he was very much engaged in, uh, in being the um, intermediary for uh, a good deal of those uh, problems. Uh, and it, it, it's to his credit. Uh, at some point, I think that there was a contractual effort and, and <laughs> Emma ran into a problem, of, a financial problem, and the UCL picked up the tab for a while, which I thought was really <laughs> weird. Uh, and I'm sure that the head of UCL would have been scratching his head uh, thinking, wow, what do you mean we're supporting the MOP now? Uh, there are lots of stories uh, like that, Brian. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's important that those stories get, re get recorded as well. Uh, you know, life is often too funny to forget. <laughs> All true. Anyway, thanks very much for your talk. Ben, thanks, can, I, can I throw up another one? This is from another ex-colleague of yours at MCI in the mid-1990s, ex-colleague of mine too, Bill Jones. Um, a general question, what's surprised you in the development and evolution of the internet? And what do you think have been the missed opportunities, if any? Well, there are some architectural uh, weaknesses in the mm. TCP IP design, uh, some of which have been corrected by a new protocol called QUIC, Q-U-I-C, which is, it was developed at Google, not by me, but by others, uh, that uh, uh, corrected at least one aspect of, uh, of TCP's design. The QUIC protocol uh, combines uh, crypto uh, mm. with TCP. Uh, which otherwise has to be done in two separate layers, which in, in, in recovery uh, is slower. So quick is a faster recovery from uh, a broken connection that can be reconnected. It also has the property that if one of the IP addresses changes, not both, but if one of them does, the connection can still be reestablished because the party whose IP address changed can authenticate based on a shared crypto variable. So it's a nice piece of, of work. 
uh, we we never really took advantage of the broadcast capability of radio, for example, and I would love to see some uh, more effort on broadcast use of broadcast capability in the internet uh, protocol stack. Uh, the, the biggest surprise for me, I think, was um, well, one of them, of course, is running out of address space and and having to develop IPv6. And the, uh, the disappointment is that we're still struggling to get these six implemented. Uh, there's a new major initiative here in the U.S. and the government side to try to push this along. Uh, we really do need to move to the higher address space structure. Uh, and then the last big surprise for me was after Tim Berners-Lee announced the World Wide Web, uh, the massive willingness of people to just dump information into the net and share what they knew uh, was uh, really quite surprising, especially given that they weren't being compensated for it. And of course, this aval avalanche of content led to the need for search engines, uh, and, uh, and many of them developed, one of which is Google. And of course, that's where I've been since 2005. And uh, I would say that that's turned out to be a surprisingly uh, successful enterprise as well. Good, good point. Um, can I build on that question about addressing? This is one from Phylon Papadopoulos. It says, I have a question relating to scale. What was the size of the first IP address space? And how did you arrive at the 32-bit link for IPv4 addresses? Was it engineered to arrive at a specific scale? Also, was packet processing time built into the design of the protocols? Well, uh, first of all, the size of the headers was an issue because we were running on 50 kilobit lines and that mm -hmm. meant, you know, the longer a header, there's more transmission delay. Uh, but we, Bob and I did a very rough, you know, rough calculation. We, we knew this was going to have to be a global network because it was supposed to be for the Defense Department and it mm -hmm. was supposed to run anywhere in the world. So we assumed it would be global. Uh, second, we assumed that there would be at least two networks in each country, so there'd be some competition. So we were already thinking about possible commercialization uh, of the system, although we didn't initiate anything along those lines, but two networks per country. Then we didn't know how many countries there were and there wasn't any Google to ask. So we guessed at 128, which turned out to be wrong. Uh, and two times that was 256. So our initial format was 256 bits for address and a network address or a network identifier. And, 24 bits for uh, uh, the host on the net. Uh, and that led to the 32-bit address space. If that had been um, you know, packed uh, uh, efficiently, that would be enough for 4.3 billion terminations, which is more than there were people in the world at the time. Now, also, please remember, this was an experiment. We didn't know if this was going to work. I mean, you know, so it's not like we were uh, planning. It's not like we were planning or certain that it was going to work to work and therefore did the final design. <clears throat> and I remember when I was running the program thinking, um, let's just get this out there and see if it works and see if we can get you know, implementations running. Uh, and if it does work, then we'll do a, um, a, a uh, what we'll call, um, I, I don't think we'll call it final, but, uh, but we, we will call it a uh, uh, professional implementation. Uh, and the problem is that the internet escaped from the laboratory into commercial use starting in 1989 uh, before it was you know, clear that, that we needed to have more address space. But the original design only had 256 networks. And then as, as the number of networks increased beyond that, we had to reinterpret those 32 bits, as you probably know, uh, into A, B, C, and D class networks, A, B, C, D, and E. And then after that, that didn't work either. And when the NSFNet came along in the mid 1980s, uh, we had to reinterpret it once again and into classless internet domain routing. Uh, and that's where we are today. Uh, I'm still a big proponent of please moving over to IPv6. Another question, this time about the link between Unix and TCP IP. So do you think the work at, UCL Ber at UC Berkeley in the early 1980s to incorporate TCP IP into Unix help that widespread adoption. Is it from Tim Rossiter? Uh, it was a remarkable uh, decision to, uh, to support that. Uh, ARPA actually went to Berkeley and funded them to uh, install the Bolt, Baronek, and Newman version of TCP IP for Unix into their Berkeley release. And uh, the, the uh, Berkeley team uh, decided that they didn't like the BBNN code and they went off and did it themselves. And so, uh, the first release of the Berkeley version of TCP IP was 4.2. Uh, 
and they had bugs and things like that, and 4.3 fixed some of them, and there have been many subsequent releases since then. That was a deliberate decision by ARPA to fund uh, UC, uh, UC Berkeley uh, to install TCP IP into Unix, because Unix had become so popular that uh, if it came with TCP IP, then it was an effortless opportunity to inject the internet capability into a growing uh, collection of university uh, research networks. One quick question uh, again, this time on UDP, uh, Vint. Um, the question is from Brian Shearing, and that is, when did, when did UDP start? Was it there from the beginning or did it emerge later? Uh, it actually uh, emerged later. Uh, the um, in initial uh, work that Bob Kahn and I did was on TCP, which was mm -hmm. very clearly a bit transport, get everything there in the right order, don't lose anything, eliminate duplicates. All of the concerns that we had for uh, unreliable networks supporting and transporting our packets. Mm -hmm. uh, so we very, were very much focused on, on delivering that sequence, uh, flow controlled uh, and uh, accurate uh, uh, capacity. But uh, I would say in the uh, 1977, 76, 77 period, as we are iterating on TCP, uh, it becomes clear that our experiments uh, with packetized voice uh, are affected by the retransmission of packets because you, you want to deliver the voice protocol, uh, the voice packets in sequence. Because uh, they clearly won't make any sense if you uh, produce them out of sequence. But if you have to use retransmission in order to get things in sequence, then you introduce delay. And delay is, the, is anathema to a voice conversation, as all of you must know. So there was a very strong proponent uh, argument by several people, some at MIT and some at, uh, at, uh, University, at uh, USC, ISI, Postel and, and Danny Cohen in particular, uh, others at MIT, uh, Dave Reed, for instance, who said that we really needed um, a low latency but unreliable capability because if you lost a packet and that produced a blip or a sound or, or nothing um, on the voice side, the person could also always say, please repeat. So, uh, so the conclusion was that we needed a real-time protocol that was not, uh, did not have all of the uh, apparatus of TCP. And so UDP came along in support of that. Uh, there was also a, a very rational argument that things like radar were also uh, needed this kind of rapid uh, delivery and not, not necessarily reliable delivery because there was gonna be another signal coming uh, momentarily. Uh, besides, you want to know where the missile is now, not where it was. So uh, real time was important and UDP emerged from that. So it, it didn't come until uh, the 1976-77 period. Great, thank you. Another question from Bill Jones, and this is now looking forward rather than looking back. What one thing would you improve about the internet and why? Well, uh, first of all, there's plenty of work to be done on security, as all of you well know, although the bulk of the security problems are uh, in the application space and sitting out at the edges of the net in the, in the uh, hosts or in the mobiles or you know, laptops and things like that. But there still are, are issues in the core of the network. So um, DNS sec for the domain name system should be implemented everywhere. Uh, we should be conscious of the need to introduce new crypto protocols in anticipation of quantum computing, as many of you, many of you know, is a potential challenge. Uh, I think that um, we also uh, need to worry about um, the uh, border gateway protocol, uh, which all of you will know is vulnerable to mistakes as well as deliberate attack. And uh, we need to build in much more uh, strong mechanisms for uh, verifying uh, routing announcements uh, so as to avoid various and sundry kinds of, of uh, amplified attack uh, that, uh, that can come from misrepresentation of, of the border gateway protocol routing announcements. So those are core areas that still need attention. Uh, looking uh, literally further, however, uh, there has been an effort since 1998 to look at uh, an extension of the internet concept to interplanetary communication 
And that work uh, started with the um, Interplanetary Network Special Interest Group of the Internet Society uh, in conjunction with uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and NASA starting in 1998. We now reached the point where we have a whole new suite of protocols that are suitable for dealing with the uh, disruption and the variable, very large and variable delay of interplanetary communication. And so that's now uh, a very different protocol uh, design than TCP IP. Uh, so uh, the important point here is that uh, you should take into account the parametric space that you're working in to decide what the protocols ought to be and, and how they should work. Uh, and we've certainly taken that into account in the interplanetary case as well. Thanks, Vint. I keep throwing these questions at you. You're doing a brilliant job. Thanks. Um, Question from Ash Vadagama, and it builds on this question about protocols. It says, do you think as some nations separate or isolate their country networks, do you think new protocols will take precedence? Well, uh, there is a growing uh, concern about mm -hmm. the negative side effects of the internet and the applications that, that run on it. Uh, social networking has gotten a black eye, but there are all kinds of other ways in which uh, the internet can be abused. And the consequence of that is that countries that care about their population uh, want to do something about that. And some of them have adopted uh, a notion of data sovereignty, which is parallel to the Westphalian notion of national sovereignty uh, in an attempt to impose a political a solution uh, using technical means. And this, of course, leads to potential fragmentation of the internet and, uh, and essentially a diminution of its utility. Uh, I believe that this is a mistaken uh, way of thinking. I believe it's correct that we have to do something to deal with the harmful effects that people, uh, to which you know, people use the internet. Um, but a lot of that is, um, is not technical. I, I mean, this is political, it's psychological, uh, it's, um, it's human motivation. I mean, look at Shakespearean, if you, if you want to think about it. Uh, you know, Shakespeare teaches us all about human frailty and, it hasn't changed in 400 years, or even 4,000 or, or 10,000. Uh, so the internet shouldn't be blamed necessarily for the way people abuse it, but we do have to cope with that. Isolation is not the solution. Now, there are some countries that want to isolate for other reasons than that. They want to isolate because they don't want their populations to have access to the knowledge of the rest of the world, uh, or they consider that the internet is inimical potentially to their own regimes. Uh, and so if you look at China and Russia as an example, uh, you'll see uh, a great desire and argument for isolation. Now, there's nothing technically to prevent that. Uh, the, the protocols are not magic. And uh, if, you, if the underlying systems don't interconnect, then the internet doesn't interconnect either. So uh, there's nothing to be done, in my view, to stop this other than argue against it. Uh, and, and to uh, argue that we should be, if you need to do isolation at all, you should use cryptographic means for that so that we keep a connected network. And it's just that the traffic that flows through the net might be isolated from everything else by using cryptographic means and making use of strong authentication to uh, enforce access control. Uh, that I think is a perfectly legitimate way of re reacting to some of the problems of uh, exposure that people are worried about. Vint, I note that Peter Scantlebury is actually on the call um, as a representative of the original NPL team. Peter, if, if you're still with us, do you want to unmute and just say a few words? No, oh, oh well, never mind. But um, the other one is a question from Brian Randall again. He wanted if you would like to comment, Vint, on the French contribution, the Cyclade network and Louis Poussin and, and their work on packet switching in Europe. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, yeah. First of all, Bob Kahn and I visited uh, the Cyclade project in 1973, as I recall. And uh, his, one of the uh, colleagues of Poussin's, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, here, I have, it, I have it right here now that I've uh, got my list. Uh, sorry, let me just double check here. Uh, Why am I not finding this? Huh. Wow, I, I'm sorry. This is, a, a, I'm just drawing a terrible blank. 
Um, one, uh, there were several people who worked in the Cicloud project. Uh, and, uh, oh, Gerard Leland, I'm sorry, he, Gerard is on the list here. So Gerard Leland and Hubert Zimmerman were part of this mod team. And uh, Gerard came to Stanford in 1974 and spent quite a bit of time, nearly a year, uh, working with me on the detailed design of TCP. So there was a very direct uh, influence by way of uh, uh, Gerard Leland from the Cyclade team. The uh, sliding window flow control mechanism was adopted uh, from, uh, from the Cyclade designs. Then uh, Zimmerman uh, went on to do the OSI work. And so he was one of the initial uh, writers of the OSI architecture documents. Uh, so, so they had a very early uh, uh, interaction with the internet. Uh, it turns out that Kuzan had visited uh, MIT and was exposed to the ARPANET project before he came back to France to start the CICLAB project and the CIGAL network, which is the moral equivalent of the ARPANET. So uh, they had a uh, role to play. Roger Scantlebury has now popped up again. Roger, do you want to say a few words? Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I had a... <laughs> My uh, PC died, and so I'm now dialed in from my telephone. And I, I didn't respond before because you called me Peter Scanterbury, unless you're referring to Peter Wilkinson. Any apologies, Roger? That was me. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, oh, I see there's a feedback loop. Wow. Well, that's too bad. Uh, and uh, yeah. Jim is muted. Yeah. yeah. So I think a, a last question, and I think this is this is quite a nice one. Um, I've now lost it. Ah. Go, come here. Consider it is from Azena Alexandrova. Considering the power of the internet, do you believe in the future of the metaverse or any other kinds of networks? Well, okay, so metaverse uh, is, uh, I guess, a virtual reality thing. We've had many uh, earlier experiences with multi-user games, uh, with Second Life, for example, which is a very crude kind of virtual reality uh, thing. Uh, I am not terribly enthusiastic about it, except to say that it might be a fun kind of gaming environment. I'm not persuaded, uh, as a meta company seems to be, that this is a you know, core future for the way in which we uh, interact with each other. Uh, in fact, I, let me give you uh, a, a, an example of why this seems so unrealistic. Uh, imagine for a moment that in order to participate in a virtual environment, you have to put on a thing on your head, on your face that makes you look like Darth Vader. So now if we were to literally show what you look like in that environment, you'd look like Darth Vader. Of course, nobody wants to look like Darth Vader except a few crazy people. So uh, you would have to invent avatars that, uh, that then represent you in this virtual environment. And of course, that will probably spawn uh, you know, uh, the virtual plastic surgery and you know, I would grow hair and there would be other kinds of responses to that. So you could never tell in this virtual space whether the thing you were looking at was realistic or whether in fact was a false representation of the party that, uh, that you're interacting with. Uh, more important, I think, uh, is that augmented reality, where the real world joins you uh, and, and joins together with information about the real world, is likely to be a very powerful tool uh, for, uh, for us. Uh, we see this in uh, simple ways today. They're, they're technically not simple, but they're simple to use. For example, if you take a mobile uh, that's running Google Translate and, and hold it up, uh, on a menu, you can see the translation of the menu into a language that you can speak, assuming that it's one of the ones that we know how to translate. That's just one tiny example of the kinds of augmented reality that uh, we can look forward to. Uh, and so that, I think, is the more likely useful scenario. The metaverse notion and virtual reality for me is uh, not as persuasive, to be honest. But that won't stop people from investing in it. Uh, and you know, there will just just like there were crazy things like petrock.com. I'm sure there will be odd things that happen in this so-called metaverse as well. OK, 
okay, we're, we're, we're drawing to a close. I know you, know you need to get away at uh, four o'clock, Vint. So perhaps I could just make some closing remarks. First of all, I would just like to apologize for all those whose questions on the, on the chat I haven't got to. Sorry, there's an awful lot of them there. Some of them just sent privately to me. But on behalf of us all on the stream today, Vint, I would like to thank you for, I think, a brilliant address and for remarkable patience and breadth in your answering your questions. It shows just how much has happened in those years and how far we've come from the early days of the internet. Thanks again to you and the intrepid early pioneers who've contributed so much to our global social and economic development. That your personal role as chief internet evangelist for Google and that of your team continues to contribute so much in the face of the emerging challenges to the unity and integrity of the net. But in closing, I'd also like to thank the archives, thank the archives of IT and the Computer Conservation Society for their support of this event. The archives is a charity with the aim of recording and raising public awareness of the history and achievements of the internet and computing industries. And they've arranged this seminar through the good offices of Professor Bill, Bill Dutton, a trustee, Tom Abraham, the executive director, and yourself into Google. The CCS can serve and restore historic computing systems and machines and run a program of regular events on the history of computing. Their support to this event is much appreciated, in particular the work of our host today, Professor Roger Johnson, and Bill Barksfield. Please everyone check out the CCS and archive websites. The next event's on the 17th of February, and it's learning from history, reflections on the past and future of the British IT industry. Finally, I'd like to say very much a thank you to the BCS for their support of us today. So thanks everyone for joining us. It's been a trip down memory lane. Vint may well remember that I chaired the Coloured Groups book for, B, book for BT. And in particular, I, I funded the Green Book and the Yellow Book. Um, so happy days. But I have to concede, Vint, you won in the end, hands down. So, <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, 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 it, my, it was not my intent to somehow <laughs> take this as a war at all. No, I, just I, want, I just wanted people to be able to network. And, of course, you know, here we are. We couldn't do what we're doing today without... Literally Absolutely. hundreds of thousands and millions of people contributing to the way the internet works today. Um, so that's enormously satisfying. So thanks for letting me uh, ramble down a reminiscent <laughs> lane uh, for, for an hour. Uh, I appreciate it very much. And I look forward to further interactions. Uh, right. Please keep me on the distribution list. I, I'd love to join uh, these calls uh, as they yeah. come along and as I can fit them into my calendar. Brilliant. Thank you, Vint, and thanks to everyone for joining today. And uh, well, I'm going to give you a clap. Bye-bye okay. for now. Bye-bye okay. for now.